Well, welcome everybody to Archive Dives with Oxen AI. This is a weekly series where we dive into interesting research papers in machine learning and AI and try to tease out their key insights so that we can apply them to our own work. Every time we read a paper, it's like we're adding a little tool to our tool chain and it's been pretty fun to see over the weeks and months how these things kind of stack up on top of each other. Today, we're diving into the iJEPA paper. JEPA stands for Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture. And if you've been following Jan LeCun at all this year, he's been hyping it up uh, constantly. So exciting to dive into what all the hype is about and look at the technique. If you're new here, welcome. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, some background on us. Oxen AI is building tool chains to help you collaborate and iterate on machine learning data sets like the ones used in this in this paper. So for example, in the paper, uh, they do a lot of work um, with ImageNet. And if you look at Oxen AI, we actually have a full data repository for ImageNet, all 56 gigabytes of it, all 1.4 million images and we're really optimized for loading in data sets with millions of rows um, streaming them to your computer and, and getting them into your training sessions so if you're interested in that feel free to check that out this paper was released april 13th 2023 uh, from the team at meta ai that's where our friend jan works um, and it, it is titled self-supervised learning from images with joint embedding predictive architecture. So the I in iJEPA is images and the JEPA is joint embedding predictive architecture. So what's the high level goal of this paper? The high level goal is to create high quality semantic image representations without relying on any handcrafted data augmentations, and they want to do this in a self-supervised manner so that it doesn't require any hand-labeled training data. If you have these high-level semantic image rep representations, they can be very helpful for lots of downstream tasks. In this case, um, they, they benchmark it on image classification, but these latent spaces or semantic representations can be very helpful for image generation or semantic similarity search between images, all the other kind of classical computer vision tasks. Um, and always just like to start with some basics uh, just for, for people, even if you're diving into this new, we wanna make sure you have a good baseline understanding. What is a latent representation? In this case, they'll be taking patches of images. So this might be like a, 16 by 16 by three patch of a dog's ear. Um, at some point they'll have a neural network that first they collapse that into one by seven, 68. And then at some point throughout the network, they'll make it even smaller and just be a vector of like one by 384. And the hope is that this vector of numbers represents what is in the image at a higher level than, uh, than the actual pixels itself. And Jan is a big proponent of this type of architecture to get these really high quality semantic, um, semantic representations. Uh, and he talks a lot about how, uh, for example, when you're driving a car, you need to do a lot of high level planning and you're not looking at every single pixel within your frame of view, you're not worried about like the images or the the leaves floating on a tree in the background or like falling. Um, you're really focused on planning your next turn and stuff like that at a higher level. The hope is that techniques like these can give us really high quality representations here so that we can perform all of these downstream tasks. So at the start of the paper, they dive into what some of the previous approaches were. So they start by talking about invariance-based pre-training. Uh, in this context, they talk just like at the beginning when we were talking about the properties of convolutional neural networks, um, They there have been some pre-training methods that do 
distortions on the images, such as like random cropping, scaling, color shifts, etc., or just like moving the image around, and then they they'll have uh, a network try to feed in the original image and feed in the one that's been distorted, um, and use that as a pre-training technique to try to get the representations for both the distorted image and the original image to be in the same embedding space. So that's what they call invariance-based pre-training. There's also generative pre-training. Um, so generative pre-training uh, is very similar to like, or an example of this could be all of the stable diffusion work. Um, and it has shown a lot of promise in terms of like generating images where you might corrupt the original image by adding noise and then try to reconstruct the, the image from the noise. In this paper, they argue that both of these techniques above uh, do not capture the semantic meaning within the images because the latent spaces uh, tend to perform worse on tasks like classification, even if they are good at generating the images. And you often need the second step of fully fine tuning uh, the network or these representations to get competitive scores on downstream tasks. So the hope of this paper is to kind of skip that second step of fine tuning the whole thing after you've done the generative pre-training or the invariance based pre-training and just have great latent spaces right out of the box. Um, so that's kind of the motivation behind this paper. So what is iJEPA? Uh, they have a great image of the full process here. And copy it in. So the idea is they take in an image, they patch it, um, very similar to what we've seen in the, the vision transformers. In fact, each one of these blocks within this diagram is a vision transformer itself. And what they do is they kind of split the patches into contexts and targets. So contexts in this case might be the dog's face and some grass around here. And then the targets would be like the dog's tail maybe the dog's foot, some parts of the dog's face. And the idea is you run all of the contexts through a vision transformer, and you also feed all of the targets through a vision transformer, but you're just feeding those patches through each time. And then as the context goes through the vision transformer, you're gonna get out latent spaces for each one of the patches in the context. And you have this other portion of the network called the predictor, which is also a transformer. And you have the predictor try to predict what the latent space of each one of the targets is. And you wanna make sure what they're trying to optimize for is that the latent space of the context is very close to the latent space of the targets um, in, in terms of an L2 distance of those two vectors. So at a high level, keep these in mind, the contexts, the targets, um, and then the predictor networks, and all of these are vision transformers um, under the hood. They say that these are different, or this type of approach is different than all of the um, generative models, or even just like the basic um, clip style models where um, you, just, you have a clip could be considered a joint embedding architecture, but not a joint embedding predictive architecture. And so if you remember from the clip paper, um, they're taking in images and they're taking in text and they're trying to make sure the cosine similarity of the images and the text are in the same space. In this case, they add in this predictor um, layer to the network to not only try to get the latent spaces together, but try to predict 
what uh, each one of the target spaces are and make sure that each one of those um, is very similar in representation to the context that was fed in. Hey, Greg. And then, yep. There's a question in the chat on what is meant by a narrow vision transformer and what the differences are between a narrow VIT and a, and a quote unquote normal one. Narrow, where did they see that? I'm curious, I'm not familiar with that from the paper. The predictor is a narrow vision transformer. I see. I think that's just saying that it's a vision transformer in the smaller set of patches. Got it. Um, but that's a good question. I actually didn't see this mentioned very much in the paper except for this sentence. So I think it's just a narrow part of the image. Cool. And then uh, our traditional generative architectures um, might take in an image, uh, encode it, and then have a decoder try to decode that exact same image. And then they're doing a loss like in the pixel space itself. Um, so another key thing to this paper is to do the loss in the latent space, um, but have that predictor in the middle as well. Uh, and we've seen, especially even in the diffusion transformers paper from a few weeks ago, doing a lot of these operations in the latent space is more efficient and gives you better results than trying to just like do the average error on the pixels themselves. Um, so this kind of puts all of those together and adds this predictor network in the middle. Cool. So the method itself, uh, they say the architecture of the vision transformers are very similar to the architecture in this MAE paper, which I've actually seen referenced a decent amount of times. Um, as we've gone through this, and that MAE paper stands for Mast Auto Encoder. So I have the link here if anybody's interested. Uh, this is very similar, but it does work more in the pixel space um, and not in the latent space and doesn't have that um, predictor network in between. So this is kind of like 2021 research that was starting to get um, really good self-supervised learning and they're building on top of this work, but do use um, very similar architectures in terms of the in terms of the vision transformer that's used. So that's a good context paper if you're interested in what the actual vision transformer architecture looks like. Um, and then so the next step within here is how do we sample the targets and how do we sample the the context. Um, so first they start by taking all of the patches of the image. So if you have like a 224 by 224 image, or, or maybe this one's like 128 by 128, and you pick a patch size, usually it's like 16 by 16 or 14 by 14, you'll patch up the image. Um, and then they start uh, by taking four target blocks that may be overlapping. Um, and so you can see up here, the target blocks themselves don't have to be the same size or shape and they can overlap. So they kind of sample um, within a aspect ratio. Uh, do we want like square one or do we want a two by three one? Do we want a one by two one? Um, so the targets kind of look like this and they're gonna have four of them in this case. In this case, they have three, but in the paper, they picked the number four. Um, and then the context block, they sample, and it's anywhere from 85% to 100% of the image. But then after it's sampled, they remove all the patches that overlap from the targets. Otherwise, it would be a little too easy to predict. So looking at what that looks like, this might be the original image. Um, they might sample a context that is this full block here, uh, which is like 85% of the image. And then they sample their four targets. And then you can see they subtracted or masked out those targets 
from the context. So then the context ends up just being this right here and the targets end up being each one of these blocks here. So they have a few examples of what the context might be and what the targets might be. And the hope here is like, if you see an eye that looks very similar to a cat, the latent representation of all of this should be close to the representation of like mouths and whiskers, um, et cetera. So that's how they pick the context and um, targets. And then for the prediction step, um, they take all of these contexts and targets and uh, they will um, try to predict latent spaces for each one of those and make sure that they're really close to each other. So what that looks like in practice uh, is they just do an L2 loss over over those latent spaces of the context and targets. So you can see they use the letter M to represent each one of the um, targets that they're gonna have. So they might have like four here. Um, and then for each one of the patches in each one of the targets, they do an L2 loss between this S is the latent space of um, the input and the latent space of the target or the context and the target. Um, so it's a pretty simple loss function here um, on the latent spaces that come out of each one of these. And as I was reading this, uh, I thought it might be nice to do a little refresher on what transformer blocks look like and what <laughs> is actually going on in each one of these blocks um, because it's been a while since I kind of refreshed myself on transformers and I'm like what does even the latent space look like when it comes out of here what how do patches get fed in blah 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 um, so I thought that would be helpful just to kind of drive all of this stuff home and really understand what this loss is being applied to um, so where does this latent space come from and how does it kind of go through the network. So if you have, you know, that picture that we had at the very start of the dog's ear, um, and it's 16 by 16 by three, the first thing they do is just flatten each one of those patches. Um, and so if you have, in this case, all of the image net images are 224 by 224, and the patch size of 16, that means you're going to have 14 of these uh, one by 678 or 6768 uh, vectors. And then I found a nice little um, diagram of what this would look like, uh, plus all of the masking that they're talking about. So um, after you take each one of these, you kind of put it into a sequence of 768 by 14 squared. So at the end of this, you're going to have a matrix that's like 768 by 196. But some of them are going to be masked out when you do the targets um, so that you don't have overlap between the targets and the context here. Um, so like, for example, these two right here would eventually get masked out of the context. And all that looks like is just like masking out the row in this matrix. Um, and then what do transformer blocks look like themselves? So you can think of a transformer block within this network is taking each one of those patches, uh, flattening it down into a vector here, and then feeding it through multiple uh, layers of a transformer block. So transformer block has multiple attention heads. It also has this re residual stream and it has a feed forward layer. And the idea here is um, within the attention head itself, it has the self attention mechanism um, so that you can kind of have each one of these patches say, hey, 
I kind of look like an ear, um, but I'm not sure what kind of ear. Does anyone else have any context of what kind of ear I might be? And like the nose might shout out, hey, I look kind of like a dog nose. Maybe if you combine both of us, we look more like a dog ear. And um, if you're curious about this diagram itself, we went through a nice deep dive on um, the mechanistic interpretability of transformers. So I think pairing that um, that dive with this, I kind of took it and replaced all of our text with images. And you can kind of watch it go through this circuit here. But at the, at the end of the day, you'll have this X0 that comes through. And you'll start with just the pixel representations. That'll get collapsed into a latent space, get run through all of this self-attention. And it'll come out the other end with like a hidden representation of x0 and a hidden representation of x1 and a hidden representation of x2 um, that now has the context from the rest of the image um, so that it's not just like a random ear. Hopefully at this point, it represents more of a dog ear. Um, and all of that connection is done through the transformer itself. Um, so. I felt like that was helpful when looking at this image. It was like, okay, great. We do all these patches and then run it through this black box. But like, what are we actually getting out on the other end? What we're getting out on the other end is the same patches in maybe a smaller dimensionality or bigger. You can kind of choose that as a hyperparameter. But hopefully by the time it gets to here and by the time it gets to here, each one of these transformer blocks has taken the context from the rest of the image and given it enough information uh, to be able to know what, what is in that block. So any questions about the transformer or this loss function um, that we've gone over so far? Question in the chat. Um if the transformers that are used for this have to be pre-trained or if they are kind of trained from scratch through this process? They're trained from scratch through this process. Um, so that's one of the big benefits of this process is you can just unleash it on a bunch of unlabeled data, in this case, yeah. ImageNet. Um, and they'll show why that's kind of cool in this evaluation section here. So how they evaluate these models is they evaluate them on image classification. Um, and what they do is what's called putting a linear probe um, on top of the representations and doing some partial end-to-end -end fine tuning and comparing what a linear probe might look like on top of the representations and what a partial fine tune might look like. Um, they compare this to many approaches from before, like namely the um, MAE architecture that we talked about. Um, and what was also interesting is they talked about um, how when usually when evaluating these vision transformers, um, and this might be helpful to have the original picture picture from the vision transformers paper. Um, but there's usually this class token that they feed in or class embedding that they feed into the model. So this is the original vision transformers paper and how they do the classification itself is yes, they take in all of these patches here, 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 and here, and they'll feed them through the transformer like we just talked about, but there's this extra learnable class embedding that they always put at the zero point in the sequence. And this isn't tied to any image patch itself, but does come out the other end of the transformer and has been combined with all the context of all the other patches. And traditionally, when you train these classification heads on top of a transformer, you're just taking the latent representation that comes out of this patch here, because in theory, the transformer has put all of the information there. So I thought that was interesting in this paper. 
they said that instead of using the class token, they adapt this Vissel recipe to use averaged pool representations. Um, so if you think about that in the context here, um, in a traditional classifier, you would have that just kind of like blank embedding here that is supposed to be the class token. Um, and they do the logistic regression just on top of that. But for this, for this example, they actually take all of the hidden representations that come out here since they don't have a class token and they just average them and then run the linear probe on top of that. Um, so I was curious if they like, when you get to that final classification step, do they concatenate them all into like a massive vector that I guess would be uh, 16 or 768 by 16, which would be massive, right? No, they just average all of these and just have um, one that's the average of all of that. So I think there is room to play on like how you actually do these classifications. And there's a couple different techniques that people use there. Um, so with that being said, they compare it um, to those view and variance based approaches um, that require yes. some data augmentation. Yeah. Evan. Sorry, Evan, I didn't see your hand. Yeah, I, I feel like the class token is reminding me a lot of attention sinks. Like it's the mm. same thing showing up where like there just needs to be the first token where things get dumped to. But it's, yeah. uh, it's interesting that it seems like it was kind of independently found here in a different context. Uh, yeah, maybe totally. it's like doing something different than we think it's doing. That is interesting. I didn't I didn't make that connection, but it is very similar to the attention sink. Um, and in this case, they're just like putting it into the architecture and learning it for classification. Um, so it's kind of in the pre-training step. But yeah, that's a cool observation. Um, cool. So then, so they compare the iJEPA to some of these traditional or not traditional, I guess, like techniques from a year or two ago uh, that operate more oh. in the pixel space. Um, and you can see it achieves higher accuracy with much fewer training iterations than a lot of these techniques. Um, so that's super encouraging in terms of it's better and quicker to train. Um, and it doesn't rely on you doing any data view augmentations to the images themselves. Um, I'd be curious if they did any research after this to like add the augmentations on top and do the latent space loss function there. Um, Cause it almost feels like those in combination would be powerful, but they're not, they're not corrupting the input or output images at all. They're just like picking different patches and making sure they align. Um, and then they did another ablation study um, on whether you wanna do this in the latent space or in the pixels themselves. And you can see that uh, the same architecture with fewer epics um, gives you much higher accuracy in the target encoder rather than in the pixel space. Um, so that's pretty concrete evidence that <laughs> these things uh, do give you better semantic representations, um, but I guess it's just in the context of this image classification task. So I'm sure people are working on this, but I'm curious, you know, when Lon, Jan talks about this being super helpful for high level planning and stuff, I don't think this paper necessarily uh, proves that out, but it does, it is very interesting in terms of you can get higher classification results with um, less compute. And hopefully that means that you have better representations at the end. Um, so this is another diagram of like the full GPU training hours that it took to train iJEPA versus um, some of these other 
MAE approach or iBot. I actually didn't dive into that one, but MAE I see get referenced a lot. Um, so learns faster and learns better. That's the main takeaway there. So in conclusion, I feel like between this paper and the diffusion transformers paper, it's very clear that we should be operating in latent spaces rather than pixel spaces. Uh, one, because it's more efficient and two, it seems to give higher quality semantics, at least for these image classification type tasks. Um, and I know we did have somebody in the community uh, try to implement iJEPA. So maybe when we get off camera here, oh, you are, actually have your hand raised. You wanna, you wanna chime in here? Yeah, uh, so I do have one question that was quite bugging me when I was implementing the iJEPA. Mm -hmm. So uh, compared to, uh, second, let me just lower the hand again. All right, so compared to MAE, MAE does the prediction in the pixel space, right? So uh, when it's predicting, um, it knows exactly what it's going to predict. And here in iJAPA, we are training from scratch with you know random weights and uh, there, there is no pre-trained weights that's been loaded initially, right? So yeah. when we give those, yeah, correct. Okay, so in this diagram, so you can see when we give that context to that context encoder, we would initially, because of that uh, random weight initialization, we would get some random gibberish kind of an uh, latent space representation, correct? The output of the context encoder. Yep. And uh, context and target encoder is an actual copy of that context encoder, 100% the same thing. So that also means the target uh, that has been masked out from that context is also some sort of a gibberish kind of uh, output. So what predictor is doing is actually predicting some sort of gibberish until the end. So how do um, you see, I, I, that's the thing that I don't understand. In MAE, at least the predictor is forced to learn something in the pixel space. Here, we are just forcing them to go in a circle like a snake biting its own tail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Um, so you're saying even once we get to this loss function right here, since yeah. it's kind of like garbage in the latent space to start. Correct, um, exactly. And I improve? tried to, yeah, I tried to uh, check the other parts of the paper in the, um, you know, that, that part with the visual thing, VISSL. I yeah. thought maybe they have uh, introduced those generators during the training time to, you know, force the predictor to learn something useful rather than those uh, gibberish uh, latent space thingy. But it turns yeah. out that they uh, plugged in that after the end. And then I tried to go into the paper and check whether they use a pre-trained transformer because I thought maybe I read it wrongly or something. But like right. you said, they are they, they claim that they trained from scratch. So um, perhaps this is the reason why my iJPA is not working. Or I don't know. I, I'm just uh, you know get, getting into some hypothesis here because the loss function uh, did its job. The loss was decreasing like in a very convincing manner during the mm. training. But when I took that uh, weights from that encoder and then downstream the task using the linear probing, the um, the starting accuracy of that downstream training is exactly the same as a random randomly initialized weight. <laughs> oh no. And I yeah, and I even tried taking the weights from the target encoder in case maybe I read the paper wrongly. And I did try to take the entire context encoder and predictor and added something else at the end to get the thing right. Uh, but it could be uh, a lot of other different factors as well. First of all, my code could have been something wrong there. Second, the data set that I used, I don't have a dedicated hardware. I just have a, uh, you know, just a PC at my home. So I went with the Kegels, uh, the Docs 77 breeds data set with only 300 key. So could be an issue as well. <laughs> it's kind of hard to um, yeah. know, but um, yeah. How, yeah, I'm curious, how much data did you train it on? And this is your implementation, um, right? Yeah, correct. It's about 300K data. Um, okay. I used uh, two types of data set from Kegel. One is the docs breed classification. Another one is docs 77 breed classification. I just added them and then, mm. you know, uh, 
clean them up for some corrupted images, those kind of things, and uh, um, kept like about 5,000 images to 10,000 images for downstream classification tasks. And the rest I trained on SSL for the SSL. And yeah. uh, I think, yeah, the main thing that was bugging me is the question that I was asking you, the snake biting its own tail kind of thing. So I was just hoping someone could shed a light on that. Yeah, that's a good question. And that's like, so that's some awesome real world experience working with it. I hadn't yeah. thought about like, how does it even kick off that process? Ben, did you have any intuition right. there? No, just that it, this discussion was really compelling. And now I'm curious and want to hear from the authors about it. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, I am going to tag them on Twitter and maybe we can post it on Reddit and see if anybody has some answers to that question because it is not intuitive to me how that would work. Yeah, Clarence, you have any ideas? Yeah, I was also going to say, uh, I don't, I haven't seen anything in the model preventing uh, mode collapse where uh, the model basically encodes uh, trivial encoding basically maps all of the image patches to uh, this uh, same representation. Mm. That is interesting as well. Yeah, because if every patch was always just the same, then you could just solve that in like one step <laughs> with the current loss function. I think they kind of uh, did this with like a weird way of, uh, I might be thinking of VJEPA and I don't know what the different Cesar, uh, but with VJEPA, they like they essentially like used um like an EMA of the neural network. Like basically they they created two copies of the neural network and the loss function was always based on like the last update of the neural network. Yeah, may, they, I think they probably used EMA here too. Uh yeah. Well then Dorana, did you uh did you uh try that? Did you uh make sure I guess use a e, uh, EMA um lag yeah. for yeah. the teacher? You did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did, see. I did. I feel like it I feel like it's a really hand wavy answer though. Like it's not really satisfying to just say, oh yeah, EMA fixes it because couldn't it still converge to like predicting zero for everything? It could. Um, I think it yeah, does help. I some, guess but... uh, there's a name for it. Uh, one is mode collapse. Another one, I think it's called the representation collapse. Oh, not sure if they are the, both the same thing. So but, I actually, uh, like, I was thinking about this problem too. And I was thinking like contrasting learning objectives where like you kind of have to like, I've been playing around with like different entropies of noise. So like the idea is that if something is noise, the rant, like the output should also be non-confident. Mm -hmm. Basically you have like two contrasting learning objectives where one essentially the limit goes towards zero and the other one is like infinity. So like noise would kind of be like your infinity. So like it would offset the limit that's going to zero for the image patches. Interesting. I feel like I'd have, I have to see that. Have to ask. Yeah, I, I honestly have not seen anyone else talk about it. I'm still experimenting right now. Cool. I love that. These are great questions. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to make a list and make a Reddit post and see if we could get Reddit community on it too. I have a question. Um, yeah. So their goal really was to try and get a good semantic representation. Yep. How does this compare to like a multimodal model? Like clip or something like that? I mean, anything, anything that, that takes in different types of inputs and outputs, different types of things based on you know whatever yeah that's a really good question i i mean they only benchmarked it against image to image type tasks right, um, right. that bothers me because I, I it seems like multimodal models would have a great semantic representation because they have to represent different types of things yep, with, yep. without any extra help most of the time so i wonder if the clip paper has any linear probe benchmarks too. I don't remember off the top of my head, but maybe they do have some apples to apples numbers there. It'd be interesting to look at. If we did a practical dive, we would probably uh would probably be a good idea to try that out. Yeah, I love that idea. Eric is our our secret weapon who's gonna start training some of these for practical dives. So we'll unleash you on that. <laughs>
Cool. I'll, I'll kill the recording just in case anybody else has uh, things they want to chime in on. But that was awesome discussion. Uh, thanks for staying up late. Uh, I know it's <laughs> it's not always the best time in, in Asian countries for this call, but I'm, I'm glad we got your takes on trying to fine tune this yourself. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.